Welcome to the Accountants Exposed podcast, where we create light bulb moments for our listeners by exposing the journeys, secrets, and insights of some of the top players in accounting. This podcast is brought to you by Michael Edelstein, Director and Founder of Recruitment Expert, a specialist accounting recruitment agency working across Australia, New Zealand, and Asia Pacific. Ladies, gentlemen, and accountants, I had the pleasure of speaking to Patrick Sargent, the CEO of Pop Business, which is making waves in the accounting industry with its high-tech approach and it's growing in leaps and bounds. He's the only accountant I know that decided to raise money to start an accounting business from scratch and built it like a corporate versus a traditional accounting business. And today, he shares his unique journey of running a fast-growing accounting firm with a corporate model and all the trials and tribulations that come with that. Make sure you listen all the way to the end. I guarantee you will learn something. Enjoy. Hi, Patrick. Thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Now, I've been watching your spectacular journey from the sidelines and have always been impressed by the innovation and entrepreneurial spirit that you and your business bring to the profession. So thank you. Actually, really looking forward to our conversation today. Excellent. Really excited. I can see you're in the office today or some bare walled place. Yes, I am. <laughs> Is that something you've been doing throughout lockdown? I have. So I've, I don't have a home office at home. So I come in here and I've got a little bub as well. And mm. so I'm in the office and um, yeah, get dropped off, picked up and <laughs> and they get my work done. So it's <laughs> it's working out quite well. Is that, is that the, the partner and the bub that drop you off and pick you up? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> How old is the bub now? The bub is, um, she's one and about nine months. Okay. Yeah. She, well, she's not a bub anymore. She's, she's I was probably... going to say, <laughs> it's like a toddler, yeah. <laughs> she's always always going to be my my little baby. But um, yeah, she's, she's running around now and speaking. So it's, it's, yeah, super cute. Wow, congrats. Thank you. Yeah. What's it like being in office by yourself? Most of, I would imagine, we, I think you just showed me it's much by yourself yeah it's it's interesting it's 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 quiet (laughs) you you, you get you know you can focus a lot I much prefer having the team in here don't get me wrong I I like the so we do offer flexible working for sort of team anyway so they so they do work from home a couple of days a week um but yeah I do love the sort of the culture that the office brings and the collaboration and yeah it's obviously a lot more challenging doing all that side of things in video calls and and mm. making sure that you know that the the context of all the messages makes sense and nothing's getting misinterpreted and and yeah. just being together so but I, I like coming in I find it yeah I, I don't know how I'd be able to do it at home <laughs> well it's hard especially as you say you don't have a, a home office yeah um, exactly you're yeah. at you're at home are you I'm at home, yeah, but yeah. we've always had a remote setup just because all of our staff are based around the country. Excellent. Um, so, and New Zealand, and also similar to you, you know, we outsource to Philippines as well. Yep. Like our admin part. So from day one, we've always been a remote model years ago before before COVID and before it became popular. Sure. But I know for accounting firms, that's obviously not the case. When did you guys move out of fish burners? So we were in fish burners when we first started and we're in there for about we're in there for about six months. Um, yeah. So it would have been back in two thousand and eighteen. Mm. And yeah, we we had about nine people in there, and it was just kind of got to the size where a co working space is is cool at the start, whilst you're yeah. you're small. And and don't get me wrong, there are ones where you can have your own private sections, and that makes yeah. total sense. But um, we ours was just open plan, and we we're finding it a bit, you know difficult to you know create a team culture and all that sort of stuff so um yeah we, we moved out in 2018 to one um, and our own office space in chippendale so pretty early on because you only opened up in 2018 as well yeah yeah so we started yeah we we started 2018 in the co-working space moved to chippendale after about six months we stayed there for a couple of years and recently we've moved to surrey hills and we got an office space here yeah okay do you know what i struggle with in open plan offices, because um, I noticed you obviously you, you have an open planning sure. for yourself. This the sound, like the ability to concentrate. Like I need silence. Sure, um, you know, like some people can listen to music, they can listen to chatter. Yeah, I've always been the guy that had to like from high school that had to go to the library every day. 
yeah. and go to the most silent part of the library where it's like, you know, the librarian walks around and shushes everyone. That's the only way I could get study done. And it kind of, I struggled in an open plan workspace. Um, yeah, so I'd be the guy that would like hog the meeting rooms yeah. in, in previous co- you know, workplaces because I just needed to, I needed the silence. Get how your own you, space. Yeah. How do you focus, especially with accounting work and, you know, strategic work, et cetera? Yeah, it's a good question. And I don't know, I think it's just a skill that's been developed over the years. We, like back at the mid-tier firms we worked at, we had open plan. And so it's just mm-hmm. kind of always been, even at smaller CA firms I've worked at, it's just kind of always been an open plan. So I guess it's all I've known. And you just kind of... It's usually quiet, isn't it? Like, I don't know, I walk through some offices and accounting firms when I when I go and visit clients and look at their setup. I'm like, it's dead silent. In yeah. Myself. Yeah, it depends on the business. Our business model is st- structured quite differently, which I'll talk about later, but that creates a lot more like noise and collaboration exactly. and having in-house sales team and marketing and operations yeah. and software and everyone collaborating on projects. So it, some of the team does prefer working from home. And so we definitely cater for that, but we also yeah. think it's really important to come in as well. So um, yeah, how, how do they focus when they're in the office? Maybe they've got their headphones in. Maybe they're just <laughs> maybe they're just ingrained in the task, and they can block out the the noise. But um, yeah, yeah, it doesn't bother you basically. Not at all. Yeah, okay. Let's start off with your journey. So, what compelled you to get into accounting in the first place? It was actually to get into accounting. I it wasn't it wasn't something that I had planned and wanted to do. It was more a um. I was on the Gold Coast and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And I finished school and I went and worked up in, in the Whit Sundays for a year and lived mm-hmm. on an island and just worked up there. For, it was about nine months. And I came, um, I moved down to the Gold Coast and I was asking, um, I was chatting to my mom actually saying, you know, what, what should I do? And she's, she suggested accounting and she said, look, <laughs> you, but you know, your grandma was an accountant, you know, you've got family that were accountants. Why don't you try it? And I was going, accounting, that sounds so boring. I love uh, it, especially when she says your grandmother was an accountant. Wait, did you love your grandmother? Was she like the coolest grandma? She, in the, she was in cool. The she was okay. very cool. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was just an interesting conversation and it was kind of like, I didn't really have a really clear idea around what I wanted to do. And so I just kind of got pushed, um, not pushed, I just got a suggestion to head in that direction and I'm really glad I did because I've found it to be you know extremely interesting on you know and when you speak to people and they don't understand what accountants do they tend to think it's this um you know you're staring at numbers all day and doing calculations and it's quite boring but it's it's the complete opposite so yeah I'm I'm, I'm really glad I I got partially directed to do accounting okay well what were you doing in with Sundays I was a porter so the this is like straight out of high school? Straight just... out of high school. So, yeah. Was... Your, your, your gap experience, basically. Pretty much, yeah. And it was basically like tying off the ferries that come in, getting the luggage. I had a few friends. Um, it was funny. I, I went to the island for a job interview just to, to do just some sort of kitchen hand stuff. And mm-hmm. I got off the boat and the guys on the jetty I'd went to school with, um, different years, but I knew them. And so they're like, come work with us. And so, yeah, I went for one job interview and did something <laughs> completely different. And it was so much fun because it was, um, yeah, it was just a really good group of guys. And there was about 100 staff living on the island. And so it was yeah. just a good time to, to be there. A lot of international people. And, yeah, we had a ball. I was, I was like, sounds like an extended school is basically. It pretty much was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was good fun. And you from, are you from the Gold Coast? I'm from Port Macquarie. Are you serious? Yeah. Okay. So I grew up in Port Macquarie. And then... Ended up in Gold Coast. Ended up on the Gold Coast. Yeah, I had a few friends living there. So that kind of okay. was the reason I went there. A few of my sort of high school buddies, yeah, they, they went to the Gold Coast. So I sort of followed them to to hang out and went went to university up there. Yeah, okay. Makes sense. Because I, I was looking at sort of where you worked and where you went to uni. And I, I wasn't sure whether you were with, like from Mackay or from Gold Coast. Yeah, I've um, moved around a little bit. How did you end up in Mackay? That one was an interesting one. It was, um, that was, I was working on the Gold Coast and I was planning on going overseas. So I, I ended up doing a year backpacking through Central America. And um, before that, I was working at an accounting firm on the Gold Coast. And when you, you know, you're a graduate accountant, you're not getting paid much money. So I 
thought I'll go and chase a bit of cash to save up and head overseas. And so I went up not knowing what sort of work I'd do. And I ended up working at um, an accounting firm there. And it was great, great CA firm, you know, really good culture. And so I, I, that's why I was up there to save some cash to, to head overseas. Just because the pay was higher? Or? Yeah, the pay was higher. And, you know, I wasn't sure if I was going to do accounting up there. It's just, you know, it, it, it just fell into it. I got a job pretty quickly. So, um, Okay. Yeah, were you thinking like I'm gonna be a fly and fly out mining? You know, yeah, driving yeah. trucks for like, six figures, exactly. yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, this is going to see what it was like because <laughs> it's it's true. Like you look at the numbers and like I could drive a truck, I could like do anything those mining guys do. And they get paid 150 grand. I know, and then you hear like I've got friends in the industry, and it's an extremely difficult job, and I don't envy doing the fly and fly out <laughs> and and that sort of stuff. So. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I guess it's an interesting um, segue into the entrepreneurial journey because accountants are traditionally seen as risk averse, but here you are kind of like, you know, you left home, you went to Gold Coast, you went to, with Sundays, you went to Mackay um, and traveled a lot. So I think that sets the scene sort of for pop tax. You know, what, yeah, tell me a bit more about what does the business do? Like, and what, what's the model behind it? Yeah. So pop tax is our first was the first business we launched. And basically, I was working at Pitcher Partners. I was at Moore Stevens and then Pitcher Partner, Partners merged with Moore Stevens. There's about 150 accountants in each firm. And so it was really interesting, different cultures sort of colliding. and But really, really interesting place to work. Great firm, really great staff, great partners. And one of the um, guys in the financial planning was Sydney and we discussed this pop tax, this individual tax return product. And I suppose we've seen an opportunity to, to basically, well, when you're doing an individual tax return, there's, it's really occupation and industry specific. So there's mm-hmm. only really a set you know, list of things that you need to, to go through to, to get the maximum refund. So we're like, wow, we can basically put you know, all this partner knowledge in a platform and, and people can get the highest refund possible. This sounds like a great idea. Um, so we kept talking about it. I left Pitcher Partners, um, headed up an accounting firm. And there I met um, a really talented software developer, MJ. And basically me, Sid and MJ got together and formulated a, a bit of a plan to launch PopTax. And so we I went and raised some capital and we built this this online tax return platform back in 2018 and we've had all the trials and tribulations of trying to link it to the ATO launching late you know just the marketing not not doing as it should you know our our forecasting being pretty out for our customer acquisition costs and these sort of things so but anyway we had a really interesting journey with that so we launched pop tax and that's been going for for a couple of years now and I think it's this year was the the fourth tax season, so eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, and yeah, back back then it was basically it, it, it's a tech tech company. So we had an in house software development team to to build out the platform, and very big on automation. We built some interesting sort of automation on the back end from from the review perspective. So created our own risk profiles for customers as to how in-depth our review process would be, given it's a sort of self-serve. They come in and they use the platform. They get guided through it. We put some benchmarking so people, you know, a teacher would claim these sort of deductions. Here's the averages just to inform people of what they might be missing out on. Mm -hmm. And created basically what it is, we created a, it's called the max deductible system. And it's a set of questions based on occupation and so we we picked up about 95 percent of you know the the individuals for various occupations and we grouped them into these 30 34 sort of header ones so it might be like a nurse a teacher tradie you know a doctor a lawyer accountant so just went through basically a list and then we obviously couldn't get everyone there was all these random occupations we didn't even i never even heard of them so we we just had a general one at the end and so we thought well that's pretty good if we can cover off you know the bulk of the people that will use the platform and make it really niche and specific you know then it then it should work quite well okay what was, what was the weirdest occupation you came across um weirdest one i mean there was a lot like there was there was ones i'd never even heard of so 
when I was trying to group them into the 34, like there were so many, I was just Googling and had no idea what they were. <laughs> so any, I, zoo, any zookeepers, you know, lion tamers? There was heaps of those. There was heaps of random ones. Um, too many to name. When, it, when I did the grouping, there was like thousands of occupations to go through. So it was, um, it was a big task just trying to put them in the right place. What's, um, I'm just trying to think back then. How, how did you guys compete with, I guess, the ATO's own self-service model, which has become easier and easier to use sure. over the years? Yeah, it's a good question. And that was, I suppose that was, I, I, I think it was so hard for us, for this ind- individual tax platform, because of you, you're versing a free product, right? My tax. And mm-hmm. over the last, say, four years, they've just really, um, you know, dominated their market share. So to you know, how we competed, well, we've tried to differentiate by saying, you know, they don't provide information. So it's kind of like you jump in and you're, you're really on your own, whereas this is a guided experience to genuinely maximize your, your tax refund. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we tried to, like, initially, we thought our competitors were all these other online tax return providers. Like your e-taxes. Yeah, and exactly. And then we, mm-hmm. we quickly learned that, you know, the ATO was really gaining market share and they were doing a big push to get people on their platform. And so I think that product hasn't been as as successful as we would have liked. And we've, I'm putting, you know, sort of less resource and energy into it. Given long term, it's it's going to be really hard to, to compete with, you know, the my taxes. Okay. So what's been your focus then? And what's been the the growth engine behind the business now? Yeah, sure. So back in 2019, we created Pop Business, which was, you know, we we're always going to do it. It was just a, just a matter of when. And so it's, it's about using a similar methodology. So being big on innovation, big on technology, challenging the traditional accounting models, so the partnership models. And so we created a, a business that services SMEs right across, across Australia, predominantly online. So utilizing software that's available and also building our own in-house software. Um, and so that's been a really, we've, we've seen some really rapid growth over the last two years that it's been happening. We've just eclipsed over a thousand business clients and the team has wow. grown quite a lot in a short time. So we're getting a lot of rapid growth and um, really big on, you know, structuring our business in a way that that's breaking out of the traditional partnership model that I feel is is very limited in its ability to scale. And it tends to be a lot of small businesses within a brand and and change management and these sort of things become really political in these sort of businesses mm-hmm. where, you know, they can't move very fast. There's a lot of conflict at, at the top to to standardize and systemize certain things. And there's a lot of partners that may be not willing to, to, to change and be flexible to wanting to keep adapting and keep evolving as the industry changes and as new technology mm-hmm. comes in. So basically creating a business model that can allow scalability is what we're really focused on and sort of using technology and innovation to, to drive that. I mean, that's massive. A thousand business clients in less than three years, basically. Yeah, it's been two years. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Impressive. And I, I guess it goes with your branding. I mean, essentially, the way I look at your brand, the way I perceive it anyway, you're kind of like millennial accountants for millennial businesses, in a way. Yeah, I think the branding, it's funny because, yeah, Pop Tax, we, we had this branding that was a little too play, playful and a little too fun initially. And I think we learned like, yeah, you want to appeal to a certain audience, but at the same time, you still you nearly be serious, like an accountant. Exactly. Yeah. And you still got to have trust. You got to build that trust. And I think yeah. being online, it's, you're going to be, there's a fine line between, Hey, we're different and we're challenging the status quo and we're online and we're with this fresh accounting firm. Um, I think you got to be really careful with not overcooking that and looking mm-hmm. too fun and playful. And then, cause I think people when it's their business, it's their livelihood. This is the most yeah. important thing, in, you know, it's for the, supporting their families. And so you've, you've got to be really cautious to ensure that you're, you're getting across the points of professionalism, trust. We are the experts because that sort of, you know, that's, that's why people will come and use you. Essentially, you're the proactive, trustful, 
yeah. expert, ex, you know, expert accountants. And so when we initially did pop tax, we had all this really fun stuff. And, <laughs> and I think we should have probably pulled back on that a little bit given. Well, what sort of stuff are you talking about? I think just the design, the graphics, the sort of branding. I think it was a little too playful and pop and sizzle. Yeah, it was <laughs> it was poppy and it was it was fun, but it was um like a re- when when people are giving out their TFNs and their personal information, you know, you've got to be really careful that you don't you've still got to come across as trustful and yeah. professional and mm. our brand. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It just I just had this um, thought in my hand as we were talking like i'm a big fan of richard branson and the whole virgin thing yeah and as you were talking about like make it and fun etc and i don't think look as far as i know he's got like 450 companies but i don't think he's ever tackled the accounting industry i wonder you know how he always does his pranks and stuff i wonder if you open up like a virgin tax or something like that. <laughs> what sort of what, what the website would look like what sort of crazy pranks he would get up to because he's all about like the whole fun and youthful you know disrupt the model um which you know, it just made me think of like when you were describing how you guys went about it. It's kind of like how probably Richard would go about it. Exactly. Yeah. He he sells um, you know, experiences a lot of a yeah. lot of the time. So he's um yeah, he his branding's very emotive and he's yeah. he's it's very fun and he's trying to get people to wanna be, you know, wanna be there, right? Um, so I was trying to imagine like what would virgin tax look like? Yeah. <laughs> I remember there was a joke that uh, he made in an interview, it was like he went into one, of, I think he was asked, um, and this is a completely side note, like he was asked, what was one of the businesses that failed? Because he's obviously gone into so many different industries. He said, Virgin Brides, because there just weren't that many. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's cheeky. Um, but anyway, moving on to sort of what you're saying, what, what does a typical business client look like for you? Sure. So for us, it's, we, we've created some really good strategic partnerships mm-hmm. and that's allowed us to grow at the rate that we have. And some of those are businesses that set up companies, et cetera. So we've got a lot of startup business clients. Basically fish burner type co-working places. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, some, some clients through that, but mostly online, um, you know, those, those online, if you're going to go set, set up your company online, we're, we're partnered, partnered up with a few of them and law firms and financial planners. And, but we do have a lot of startup businesses, um, a lot of small businesses. And like when we, when we were first starting Pop Business, you know, you've got your big four that sort of tackle your, your high, really high net wealth and listed, et cetera. You've got your mid tier that targets, you know, your mid sized companies and some high net wealth, et cetera. And then, the accounting industry is really sort of fragmented and spread out across thousands of accounting firms and and it's a bit non-transparent like people are getting wildly different quotes for the mm. same work and it's it's a pretty yeah we there's like 2 million small businesses and and those are spread out across you know your suburban accountants and so we just see a good opportunity to sort of target the small business market and provide affordable chartered accounting level sort of accounting services online. And so our target market has essentially been sort of industry agnostic. And we've just sort of based on the partnerships that we've established and the leads that have came in, we've got a lot of startup businesses, some tech companies, we've got construction, we've got professional services. So it's been sort of a diverse range of businesses, but more so in that startup to small business space. Is the focus on just doing the compliance for them or no, do you go into the advisory yeah. as well where you, you know, do monthly management reports for them and give them a, you know, of course, yeah, business performing? for sure. And I think most accounting firms would pr- probably do this, but um, yeah, we did virtual CFO for, for some clients and some, some high growth clients and do monthly cash flow forecasting and uh, monthly meetings and companies that you know are expanding internationally we've done a whole bunch of advice and it could be around financial models could be business models it could be um, tax advice you know people selling companies overseas and how to get the cash back and all these things so we've got quite a diverse range of advisory services that we've provided the bread and butter is the compliance and what we're trying to achieve is to really simplify the packages make it really transparent monthly 
sort of packages based on what they need. So you've got your core compliance and then we just add on um, advisory or bookkeeping or payroll or, or, or other services as they need it. So we always start with the monthly yeah. com- compliance packages. We, we, we had to spend a fair bit of time trying to work out like how to price it and it's changed over, over the years and, and work out how to standardize it. We've got three in-house sales people now. And so we've forecasted to grow our sales team to six by the end of the financial year. And so if you've got sales people that don't have accounting experience, you've basically got to standardize it and, and make it simple enough for them to be really confident that they know exactly what the product entails and they can sell the product and they can explain the product. And if there's upsell opportunities for if the you know potential customer is requesting different services, how do we package that up? And so we've put a lot of time into sort of standardizing our pricing and and trying to create, you know, products that that are really simple and scalable. Okay. Do you put everyone on zero? Is yes. Like all your clients straight away? Which we try to. <laughs> we definitely <laughs> recommend it. So we yeah, we we use zero a lot. So we try and get as many clients on zero as possible. There's also some other great software out there at the moment too. So um like we're not just zero. We don't mind if clients are using other software. We're more than happy to to work with that. But I think around over ninety percent of our client base is currently using zero. Yeah. What do you guys use in house just for your workflow management and yes. Yeah, so we've it's it's interesting. We've built our own we've built some of our own tech. So we've built our own invoicing system, proposal mm-hmm. system. We've we've sort of synced sales CRM to our our back end um, CRM, mm-hmm. and we've got a partner portal that syncs to all that to track commission, etc. So from the sales perspective, they've got a CRM separate that syncs into our system. They do the proposals for our back end system. We've connected a backend system to Zero Practice Manager, so you can create jobs within our backend system. So once once a once a lead comes in, um, it goes into the pipeline for the sales team, yeah. and goes basically in as a deal. And once it moves through the stages and um, the proposal sent, hopefully it's accepted online, paid, then goes to a deal one, mm-hmm. and then we have our system synced to Zero Practice Manager and it creates a job in Practice Manager. And so we use Zero Practice Manager for the workflow management. Um, mm-hmm. We're currently building out a client portal. And so our next sort of project is this connecting everything together. So we've got this sort of start to finish system, deliver the services through the platform. And um, hopefully we can, you know, in, sort of innovate and build upon our, our client portal platform and sort of invest a bit more in the client-facing products. So initially we spent most of our time on the sort of non-client-facing technology for the for the yeah. business side. And it was just trying to build a foundation that we can grow from. And once we've sort of, we've, we've sort of got to that point now where it's all pretty standardized and we everyone knows their roles and everything's tracked and and the reporting's there. So now it's about what's the client facing products we can start to to build that sync into our systems. Yeah, okay. Is that I guess is the impetus to build everything with your own platform because you weren't happy with what's available in the market or you don't really fit to purpose? Or what what was the reasoning behind to like build everything Because like, you know, for example, proposals and sales and yeah. a lot of stuff. There's just so much accounting tech already out there sure. these days. Yeah, it's a good question. I think the 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 sort of the reasoning for that was just based on the lead volume. So we're getting we're just getting so many leads coming in each day that we really needed a system that was scalable. And you know, based on the lead volume, it's not like we're we're getting a couple of leads a day. We're talking like a high volume of leads with with all our sales is um, you know from inbound um, leads. So we we needed a system that was sort of customizable that we could um, change based on our requirements. As an example, if our partners are sending us leads, we needed to track the commission and we needed to do all these things for our partner portal. Mm -hmm. So it just made sense that we had this system that, that we could update really quickly for changes that we needed. 
Um, so that was the nexus for that. We didn't go and try build a workflow management platform or anything like that. Like, you know, we love using Zero. So we there's a lot of software in the market that we um, we use, but I, th- I think the next step is the, the client facing side of things so creating a scalable client facing product and solving a few key customer pain points um to sort of enhance our service offering mm. so this helps that you have your own development team and mj is one of your key partners yeah uh, and i think like the the advice that i've seen for startups that i'm invested in startups as well it's if you have multiple partners you always need one at least one tech partner um as one of the kind of two or three founding partners. Um, so I think, was that strategic? Like you guys, would you have ever gone out on your own without having someone like MJ? Yeah, it's a good question and definitely not. So like our sort of, um, you know, a sort of long-term sort of strategic plan is to be like, you know, the Apple or the Amazon of accounting, right? And we need a lot of innovation and a lot of investment in technology to get us there. So, yeah, we, it's, it's, a, it's an absolutely crucial role um, given if you want to scale a business and you want to sort of get a multiple, you know, return on your business, you need, you need to um, be investing in technology. And with my background not being in technology, I, I knew that was a really critical role to fill and it was kind yeah. of a you know, as a necessity, especially because we started with pop tax. But I think even if we didn't start with just like an individual tax return platform, given that we were trying to sort of create something that is scalable, we we definitely would have got MJ on board um, regardless. Hmm. How big is the development team now? So we've got two developers in-house. We we did have more initially when pop tax was first getting built, et cetera. And then it was more a maintenance um, side of side of things. Mm-hmm. And we, we also outsource some of our development. So we've got um, some software developers overseas that we, so there's a team over there that we outsource a, a lot of the, um, a lot of the design and the, the front end to. Do you control your overseas teams or are they kind of part of a business that you outsource? It's interesting that you asked that because I listened to the the podcast you had with the outsourced accountant CEO. What was his name? Uh, Nick. Nick. Yeah, it was a great, great yeah. listen. So we use, we go through, go through TOA. Yeah. Yeah. With shout out, shout to, out Toa. to TOA. Yeah, <laughs> no, they've, they've been great. I think they're a really, really great company. So we've got, yeah, we've got five. We've just hired a six. And we've kind of got a hiring strategy strategy to keep sort of expanding our offshore team. Okay. And for the developer guys, same sort of thing? Is there a company that provides them or are they individual? Yeah. So the art, the development team's different. So the, the accounting team's like basically like having your own accountants in-house. Like like I feel mm-hmm. like they're, they're our employees. That's how I th- I think about it. We, you know, we do do the whole hiring process, which is who we get on board. And then they join all our systems processes. We do all the tr- do a lot of the training, and um, even from a cultural perspective, try and um, make sure that our culture is coming through to to them as well, and they're well supported and they understand what mm-hmm. we're about. So they're kind of really ingrained in the business, but the development team is more contractual basis and it's more project basis. So it's like, you know, if we've got a project to get, get done, they sort of contract us, complete the project and then we mm-hmm. re-engage them once we have the next um, sort of... How do, you, how do you go about finding the contractors for the development side? Yeah, so that was through um, Sydney and MJ and so they had a contact that they knew and... Mm-hmm. So that kind of was how that came about. So it's mostly a, they knew someone and that someone yeah. um, connected them to the, the right people. Yeah, okay. So mostly freelancers. Yes. Oh, it is, sorry, it okay. is through a company. Um, it yeah, is through a company. Yeah. Okay. Um, you talk about like Toa. What, what's been your experience of having that outsourced team in the Philippines, like in terms of retention, training them and, and output? Yeah, it's... It's an interesting one. Like they've been great. We've got a really good team and we've like, it's been pleasantly surprising how good they, how good they are and how capable they are and how much value they add. There is a, how long, how, how long have you had, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, have you started using like the outsource model from 
the get go, or was it more? It was more recently. So we started, I think it was around August last year. So we did a year without, basically, and then we've kind of had a year with. Yeah, I I think it it is a bit of work, and you do need to to train, and you need to create the processes, and it isn't like a set and forget. So it's an ongoing Mm -hmm. thing that you need to manage, and you need to you need to be on top of. So yeah, it's 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 definitely it's definitely something that requires time and it and it requires you know you to make sure the right processes and framework is in place it's not something you just say oh i'll get an offshore team and flick them a bunch of work it doesn't work like that so you it's you really need to spend the time on making sure that everyone understands their role everyone understands the work papers and how the business works um making sure you're giving them the work that you know, that they're capable of doing and that that you want them to do. And then having the right management and oversight of the team has been, you know, really critical. So we do lots of regular meetings, um, workflow meetings. And so I think just that communication, clear communication, we do lots of video calls. um, And so I think that really helps. But yeah, it's definitely something that to get the model right is it takes a takes a bit of time, but it's well worth it. So you do obviously the efficiencies, the efficiency gains are, are quite big, and and mm-hmm. it depends on people's business model as well. So if you've got bigger clients, it might not make sense because you're already getting quite big fees and big margins. But if you're servicing smaller clients and the margins are a lot thinner, um, it makes sense for for a lot of the non technical work to get outsourced which is what we're sort of working on. So for us, it's a work in progress like, as well. Like bookkeeping. Yeah, bookkeeping, yeah. payroll, even data entry, preparation yeah. of some of the work papers. Um, so they're quite capable accountants as well, like CPA qualified. Mm. And But you've got to treat them, as Nick said, like they are your own staff. It's not, as you said, set and forget. You actually have to invest them like you would in your own employee. Hopefully. That's exactly right. Yeah, so we, we haven't had any turnover and they're they're all seem pretty happy and um but yeah it's it's exactly right you've got to really treat them like they are a part of the team and and long term it should work well are you hands-on in any of the work at all some of it um i used to be a lot hands-on especially in the first year whilst growing the business so obviously had to be hands-on when we didn't have a very big accounting team but now probably maybe do about yeah maybe 10 to 15 percent is yeah. is dedicated to accountant accountant um, counting clients, mm-hmm. and yeah, we've we've got a really strong accounting team now, which has helped me step back a little bit and do more of the strategy, the vision, the direction, the projects. Um, and there's there's so many little things we're trying to achieve and work on it, and it and it sort of requires a lot of time and energy and effort to sort of push ahead with those projects. So. It's been good stepping back a bit, but I do love doing the accounting work. And, you know, there's there's a few clients that I've got good relationships with and they still contact me regularly. And it's just been the nature of the beast where, mm-hmm. you know, I was a point of contact initially and then it's gone to others and then they still like hitting me up every now and then. And that's fine. And I don't mind having the odd call, et cetera. But I do try and, you know, reduce the client comms as much as possible because, um, whilst it's really important and your customers are, you know, the most Im- one of the most important things, it's also like the time that you're allocating to, to all this is sort of slowing down the growth opportunities because then you're not focusing on creating new partnerships and setting up new funnels and investing time in the, the project management for the technology. And I mean, yeah, it's an, it's, it is essentially an online model and it's like you're meant to be a high tech accounting firm. Um, it brings up an interesting point. And have you had clients transition from traditional accounting firms to you guys? We have, and I, I think um, it's. I think any accountant would attest to this. It's yeah, it's an interesting model we've got because it just brought up a point in my head around getting new business owners, which create you mm-hmm. know they require a lot of handholding, and there's a education piece um, as well. So we've had to develop a lot of framework to assist these clients in a way that's commercially viable, if that makes sense, um, given they're new to business. The clients that come across from, say, a traditional firm, um, we love. They're they're great clients because they see how we're doing it and we're online. So it's an easy transition for them? Like, do they... Much, 
much easier. Yeah. Okay. Because I was curious whether they expect a lot more of that partner style contact. And therefore they're like, well, Patrick, you're the partner. Like you and Sid, I, I, I expect meetings with you, you know, I expect a phone call with you on a quarterly basis. Yeah. Um, whether there is that aspect there or whether they're like, no, you know, we know we moved the cost to you guys. You guys charge less. Don't really expect anything. You do my compliance. We're all good. Like what, what what's that like, that transition from traditional to you? Yeah, it depends on the business. So there's been certain businesses that sort of require our expertise. Um, so if we're doing a virtual CFO meeting and that, that's totally fine. And But I think the majority of clients, like our team's really strong as it is. We've got, you know, the seniors who are ex-mid-tier, the managers, ex-KPMG. She's, she's got more experience than me. So it's um, we've got a really strong team and there's less sort of... Um, Given the type of model we have, traditional firms, the partner wins the work usually. So the partner yeah. kind of feeds the work into the team and you've got the manager and they, they, you got the client comms is sort of split between the team. Some just have the manager, some have it split between all the mm-hmm. team members. Partner might deal with the really um, larger fees that make up, you know, they might have 20%. 80% of their fees coming from 20% of their clients or something. So that 20% they're really servicing and the partners are really engaged in those clients because, you know, why wouldn't they be if they lost those fees that dramatically decrease their book? Whereas our model is completely different where we don't have sort of like key account risk. It's very spread out. We don't have just like large accounts. Mm-hmm. Um, so our fee, ba- fee base is relatively like for the most part, really spread out and being online, the, the clients don't, come in saying I want to deal with Patrick or Sid they they usually they're either referred through a partner or a current client or they find us mm-hmm. online and when they come through they speak to the sales team um, and the sales mm-hmm. team then scopes the the what they need and what type of business they are how old are they how big are they what, what did they previously have if anything what do they need and then it gets allocated to the manager so the there's never the expectation from the get-go for for a very large percentage of the clients that they will be liaising directly with, say, myself or Sid. Mm-hmm. So I suppose that works quite well. There is a lot of existing you- clients that kind of might expect it, and that's fine, but we, we try and limit how much mm. we go forth on that. Is there a dedicated, like, account manager or a client manager at all, or is it kind of whoever ends up doing the work, they end up doing the work, and it's all mostly email based anyway and they just get their you know tax returns done and yeah so we have yeah it's, it's interesting we kind of structured the team levels in a way where they deal with different types of clients so mm-hmm. if you if we've got a bigger client that's more technical it might go to a senior or even a manager but if it's a brand new business or a say a sole trader transitioning to a company and they're ticking over 90k in sales we're really comfortable giving that to say a junior accountant to handle the comp so it depends on the type of client and the sort of the technical ability required to to service them so as long as we're and the when i say junior accountant they're fully qualified studying ca so they're you know they're, they they know what they're doing um and and so we're quite big on empowering the employees and giving them as much client facing time as possible and that probably brings us to where the industry's heading because it's it is evolving and technology is evolving and automation's constantly increasing so there is a bit of a a really strong push towards the advisory piece and the client management and the client mm-hmm. relationship piece is just getting more and more important as the industry evolves and so mm-hmm. one of our really core objectives is getting the accountants um, really strong on the client relationship management and the advisory side of, of the role as well. So the compliance and taxes of bread and butter, we makes up for a large percentage of our, our fees, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But I but I do feel that that over time and it is happening now, there's there's you know a, a big push in automation. And I'm not it'll never I don't think it'll get eliminated by any stretch, but I just feel like it's the clients value the relationship management, even if it's explaining and talking through. You still have that contact, like your your staff would still get on the phone with them or have Zoom meetings with them. Of course, yeah, yeah, of course. So yeah. video calls, 
Some clients in person. So we do see the odd client, but very small percentage and very big on video calls, phone calls, emails. Even your junior staff will basically get a call and then explain some of the... Is is that part of a process where like every client will get a, you know, at least a call or a... Of course, yeah. A meeting with one of your staff to explain to you know to go through the the books or the numbers. Yeah, of course. So we're huge on communication. So that's kind of uh, one of our differentiations is um, mm-hmm. you know being good communicators, and it's one of our values. So, and I suppose that's like thinking it from a product product perspective. There's a lot of opportunities in the future for you know what usually used to happen is an email gets sent saying here's your compliance issue financials yeah, good basically. luck understanding all this um here's our fee um and off we go into the the sunset so i think that's pretty much how my accountant does it yeah. it's most <laughs> yeah and 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 that's where we see huge opportunities to innovate through some sort of platform that delivers the product the, the tax return and financials or advice whatever it is through the platform and then maybe a, mm-hmm. some some innovation to upsell or even just you know, as, as part of the product, provide the advice on what they need to be aware of, what makes sense and give them the opportunity to really ask some questions. Cause that's sort of, I suppose, from a customer point of view, that's probably what's lacking a little bit. It's the communication about what's happening and about the product. And, you know, most small business owners don't understand their accounting and tax affairs. So if we can provide Mm -hmm. that sort of extra layer of advice, it's going to add a lot of value to, to them. And you actually do that now? Yeah, so we're doing it now. So, But okay. now it's getting done more so around the, the conversation versus the, the video. So we want to see in the future if we can, you know, do something on that front. Okay. We'll, we'll circle back to that in terms of like, I guess I, I'm curious to touch on the sort of skills you look for in staff to be able to deliver that. Um, but I want to come back to sort of how you got into this model like did you always know you'll be an entrepreneur and start your own thing or was it like did you imagine this is the path that you'll be taking when you got into accounting um i I don't, I don't think i necessarily knew i was always wanting to do something like this this i couldn't have imagined it to be honest but doing my own thing was something i always knew i was going to to sort of try my own thing whatever it was it's interesting that it landed in in this. I wouldn't never have imagined doing this when I was at school or out of school, even at university. Mm-hmm. I couldn't have imagined I'd be in this position at this point. Neither, neither could your grandma. <laughs> <laughs> no way. If you if you knew me, you, you wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't imagine it's possible. But um, no, I I, th- I think I think there's just been a culmination of events that have led me to to this point. And yeah, I've always been sort of willing to take risks and try things and you know never been afraid of what might happen and I suppose that set me up to take Mm -hmm. these and I still do it we still do it on a regular basis so we're never we're never comfortable in this this business it's it's never comfortable it's it's highly stressful it's there's there's always big things happening regularly um you know you could make a movie each day you know it's just every day there's something crazy happening that's different to to the last but you know we wouldn't have it any other way and i think just being being open to like not you know wanting to take risk trusting myself believing that that it can work has has really pushed me in this this direction how do you guys all jump off the cliff i guess like you know in terms of saying hey and obviously we're all young, but, you know, not that young. Like you probably had bills to pay and some of you had partners and, you know, mortgages, et cetera. Um, jumping off the cliff and saying, cool, you know, we're going to walk away from our comfy accounting jobs and salaries and then go into this thing with zero clients <laughs> and hope that it works and compete against the ATO. Yeah, it's, it was an interesting decision. And yeah, I, yeah. And you mentioned families, like I had a bub, we had a, about about a year and nine months ago so it was um yeah it's been you know it's been really challenging to be earning a minimum wage during times where you could really use that cash but i don't know the way i see it is you know if if you sacrifice now you can be you know sitting pretty for for the future so it's all about it's all about sacrifice so it's yeah we had a good, good good paying jobs we had great cash coming in but there wasn't much future 
with with that so it was for me it was you know what can i sacrifice or how how much am i willing to give up now and for how long to ensure that i can create something of of value that can support my family in years to come mm-hmm. but why not i don't know for example work towards being a partner yeah and it's funny i actually the i actually did get offered that when i was leaving the the place just before mm-hmm. just before starting pop tax and we went and had lunch and he had the the discussion was around part, partnership and and what um, negotiating basically the terms of how that might look and i don't know i just really wanted to do this this thing do my own thing um i just seen a big opportunity and really wanted to back myself into trying something i don't know pro- <laughs> it was a, it was a ton of risk and basically sacrificing a lot to to try this which is which has probably made me work so hard to try and make it work and you know given looking at what i could have had and what was kind of on the table to where you know where i'm you know at fighting it out you know with my my partners to to survive and make this business something great it, it probably adds that level of motivation to to what we're doing and it, i guess it wasn't like an overnight thing where you just decided hey well, let's just open this up i mean it, it sounds like it was brewing in your mind for a couple of years prior to actually, you know, opening your door. That's exactly right. Yeah. We had a couple of years of planning and discussing and multiple conversations around how it could work. And so, yeah, there was a fair bit of time that went into the decision around starting it. And then when we finally did, we we had our minds pretty set in stone around doing it and what we wanted to do and Mm -hmm. how it might look, even though especially pop tax didn't plan out how we thought it would. But yeah, we, we, we definitely were ready to, to take the plunge at the time. Tell me a bit more about that, the investor model, because you said you went out and you got, um, you know, you fundraised basically. Uh, was that always part of the plan or was that kind of like yeah, that, last minute or an opportunity that came out or something? Yeah, that was always part of the plan. And it's been a blessing and a curse because we've <laughs> there's been some benefits in... So yeah, it was part of the plan and we needed to raise the capital to fund the cost of the build and then to also launch mm-hmm. the product to get some traction within the market. Um, so you, we needed to expand on the marketing to try and drive. Is that like MJ's criteria? Like I'm not coming over until you got money to pay me. It was kind of like <laughs> that. He was the last one. <laughs> yeah. He was the, the hardest to get across when he yeah. finally did. Yeah, we, we had we had a cash and we had some 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 stuff happening, but... Yeah, I, I just think it's been like a blessing and a curse. Like we've had to report to investors even when things weren't working out. So it's been extremely sort of depressing at times mm-hmm. and stressful. So when it's not going to plan and you've still got to show up and go, well, this is what happened this year. It didn't, didn't work with a tail between Exactly. Your legs. <laughs> and, and try and explain like why things have happened and how you're going to sort of go forth and you know, what you're going to do to address the existing year, etc. So it's been good having to do the reporting because it's kind of made us be a bit structured and, and accountable as well. So we've never really mm-hmm. had that ability to relax and be like, oh, it's just us, you know, I can just chill for a couple of years and work it out. There's always been that pressure to try and drive results, which has got us mm-hmm. moving really quick. So we're always trying to... Mm-hmm. We're always trying to see what's next and we're always pushing ahead to try and, you know, grow the business. And even the valuation, like raising at a valuation initially and then pop tax not doing great as well as it should have, then you've, you've got this valuation sitting over your head. You've got this pressure from investors. You've mm-hmm. got so I think that's sort of helped with the SME business because it's made us like it's made us push really hard in a short period of time to build some growth and to lay the foundation and and to also think about scalability so trying to get a return for your investors means we need to grow this business to to a pretty good size right so we can't just build a book of a couple of mil in rev and you know wash our hands and go sit on a beach no we've got to really build something of value to to get to get a return so it's it's really driving us to create a scalable business which kind of was the thinking initially anyway and that was a plan but having investors sitting outside it's it's been good from having to report like a like a, a larger corporation might and be really accountable to your results and the position 
of your business mm-hmm. and the performance. And whilst they're really nice investors and they're great, great people and they're <laughs> very forgiving, um, there, there is a, it's still their money and there's still an expectation that you've got to deliver results and create some value. Do you have like a board of directors kind of? Um, set up with them no or? we don't have a board of directors no. yeah we haven't really needed it yet i think if we got bigger it might be for like the the reporting and governance and and those sort of things yeah. but and how did you go about doing that like the, tell me a bit more just about the process like cool you decided to leave your employer um walk away from potential partnership etc what was your approach to fundraising? Fundraising it was, um, so I had a lot of high net wealth clients at the role I was at, which allowed mm-hmm. me to sort of see if they were interested in what I was thinking of doing. And given I built that trust and rapport over a couple of years, so mm-hmm. were, you know, there was that little level of trust. They knew how I operated. They knew I was good at what I did. And so that made it a little bit easier. We had to you had an interesting role. Your, your, your role was head of tax and accounting. And you went from, you know, essentially like an intermediate senior accountant and a pitch partner straight to head of tax. Yeah, that was a huge step up. Yeah, I was like, I didn't see no, that, that was... how, how, how did that come about? Uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. I'll be honest, I, I didn't 100% know the role once I took it on. I thought I did, but I didn't. <laughs> and so that was um, that was a really deep learning curve and I learned so much in mm. in in that period and it was kind of like fail fail fast fail hard and just be really really quick moving um it was really difficult to be honest that that it's a good, good training it was great things. yeah it was it was it was <laughs> great and I think that's like people humans are really adaptable and that's why we're big on empowerment within our business because I've seen myself do some some things that aren't common in the industry and people say you can't do that and, I, and i've done it and done it quite well and so when i look at the team i think yeah of course they're capable of course they can do that and maybe they don't get it 100 percent right at the start but they'll learn really quickly and if they're smart mm-hmm. and got a good head on their shoulders then you know we're big about allowing people to get a bit of exposure and sort of speed up their traje- trajectory as opposed to sitting out the back and punching data entry, et cetera. But yeah, it was a, it was a steep, steep learning curve. <laughs> okay. So basically from what you're saying, you, you went out to your former clients as a, as a first step. Yep. And it was a long process. Raising capital is hard and takes time. And I learn a few little techniques is, is, is that, that was really helpful putting, putting dates on when you're going to close rounds and things. So if you keep it open, yeah. you, you tend to find it's really hard to get the final commitment. Yeah. You have to create a bit of FOMO. You yeah. do, and you need to create urgency, and you also need to create, hey, this is finishing at this date. If you want to join, you can come join. If you don't, you don't have to. That's fine, but but this is closing here and here and then. Did you get advisors around you to come up with prospectuses and you know, get coaching? For no, so I did it all myself. I did a lot of modeling did a deck so we we built it all ourselves probably went a little bit overboard on the modeling for a seed round um <laughs> we we went really in depth with the modeling and we're like we're gonna be the amazon yeah right of accounting. <laughs> guys maybe we're billions you better get in yeah. quick rounds closing next week we've got That's so right. much interest but it, it's challenging it's really difficult raising capital the first first we we done two rounds over two years. The first, the initial round was really difficult and it was hard to get the cash in and timing was, was getting like worse and worse because we needed the cash in to start the, the tech and the tax season was coming up and it was getting later and later. And it was really mm, difficult. That's true because if you miss out on that, it's a lot of revenue. That's gone. right. You've got a short window. And so the first... Did you start fundraising before you left or after you left your employer? After I left. Yeah. After, okay. And so I left and we started doing all the planning, et cetera, and started basically doing all the documents to get ready for the, for the capital raise. And yeah, when we finally got the money in, it was, it was great. And then we ended up needing to do a second round in the next year. And that mm-hmm. round was really easy. Like that was, we, we closed that off within a couple of weeks and we had same group of investors different or... um and existing yeah, investors okay. um said yes yes we're interested and then just 
didn't come back. And so we, we, I went ahead. I wasn't going to wait given how hard it was the first, first time to get the cash in. And so the second round, I just went out and, and got it really quick and the existing. So what, what does it mean? Like just walk me through the process. What does it mean to go out and fight? Like you told me, yeah, you approached some of your high net worth. Is that the same approach? Yeah. I, just go, go exactly. So I had a network, um, fortunately through the, the existing role and it was just about advising and advising them of what I'm up to. This is the opportunity. Do you want some information? So pretty informal, just mm-hmm. to, Hey, I'm up to this. Is this of interest? Not everyone said yes. Um, of course. Um, but, and then there was obviously negotiation parts to it, which is yeah. pretty common in any race where it was like shark tank. I'll give you a hundred thousand. Give me 50% of your, of your business. Kind of was, well, it kind of was a little bit in respect of like these people had really good networks themselves. And so to get their investment, I had to speak to VC people and, and go down that route as well. So it was really good. I did lots of pitching, um, sort of refining, you know, what the, the, the value prop was. Thought I knew what people wanted to hear and it wasn't what people wanted to hear. So well, can yeah. you share some of that? Like, what, what were the biggest learnings, I guess? Like if someone was raising capital now, one of your clients or a mate of yours, what, 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 what would be some of the learnings you would share? Yeah, so the main thing is obviously it starts with a deck, having a really simple and easy to understand deck mm-hmm. having a really simple financial model so you can show that you understand how the, how you're going to monetize the idea and i think that the key is probably less is more is a good good one so i think when you try to be too specific with everything it creates too many questions and also you're doing a lot of you're doing it all off a lot of assumptions that aren't yet potentially tested mm-hmm. And so like some of my VC calls were like really grilling me on all these numbers and stuff. And it was just like, I went into a lot of detail and it was sort of a detriment to me because now I'm explaining like all these drivers that. You're explaining. The yeah. And it, and it cre- because you'd be like, yeah, you'd be like, well, what, what's the, what's behind this assumption? How'd you get that number? And you know, what's behind that number, et cetera. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, so I suppose it depends on the round because each each round is different. Um, but if you're going to a seed, if it's a seed and it's your first round of funding, it's just being really clear on the opportunity, how you're going to get some traction within mm-hmm. the market, um, who's the team, so so what's the expertise and the skills of the, the founders that are starting the company. And, and I suppose it's just conveying that you're all in you're all in on the project sort of you got no life rafts this is going to work this is why it's going to work make sure you've you've done the research and you've got a good understanding of the product and the market and where you're going to fit within that Mm -hmm. understanding the the size of the market's really important Um, a lot of people go way big on how big the opportunity is so whilst it's important to be you know hey there's this multi-billion dollar opportunity it's it's also about being realistic about how you're gonna you know approach your go to market strategy and who your target market is and yeah. where you're gonna find your areas of growth but yeah the key key thing is the people and you being an investor you probably try and if, if you're looking to do an investment i think the main thing is you're probably looking at the person and do you think they can do it do you think they can achieve what they're saying they want to achieve? So I think having conviction in, in what you're doing and, and having a real purpose about it is super important. So why, why are you doing what you're yeah. doing? And, you know. Especially at that seed round where there is no business to invest in. It's, they literally are investing. That's exactly in, right. You know, Patrick. So can Patrick really pull this off? What he's saying is going to pull off, yeah. Makes sense. Second round, there is a business, there's numbers, there's no longer assumptions, there's a, a growth trajectory, there's a marketing plan. It's exactly. Like, it changes quite quite drastically yeah. between the, the rounds. How many investors did you guys get on board the first time? First time, I think there was, there was about seven in the first round. And then in okay. the second, there was just two. Okay. So how, how much equity did you guys have to part ways with? If that's not a secret. No, it's fine. Um, so we raised... 750k and we gave away about 20 percent. okay and what was that like for you guys like was that a number that you decided up front like this is the maximum because there is that element of as a family like losing control yeah and it's important so you don't give away too much and i think there's some like standard sort of 
you know, I think I think 10 to 20% is pretty common, you know, to give away 20%, you know. To... Yeah, but it's a massive valuation for a, like a zero business. Yeah, that's business. correct. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Impressive. Um, so we raised capital, we started a business, you've got plenty of cash to, I guess, get you through. Um, how long did it take before you guys like became, you know, or hit break even? Not till recently. So we've, we've, it's taken quite some time given it's kind of like, if you want to grow fast, it's really hard to be, you know, profitable and have high growth. So they they don't yeah. really go hand in hand very often. And so for us, we're sort of grappling with the growth and the profitability of the business. And it's an interesting mm -hmm. sort of mix where we're seeing if we can sort of, you know, keep the margins up enough to fund the growth activities um, and and grow at a rate that we want to grow at. So that's kind of the, yeah. it's, it's good yeah, yeah, that's right. I do a lot of modeling, a lot of planning, a lot of forecasting and <laughs> breaking department modeling down. And yeah, yeah it's, it's not easy. And, and especially when you've got technology in house. So if you're doing technology and if you sort of got a different model whereby you've got, sort of a bit more traditional accounting firms are very, you know, big on return on labor, so productivity, et cetera. Yeah. And so when you've got non-productive time, you know, you need to have enough meat in in the accounting work to cover your non-productive costs. Um, mm -hmm. So if you've got in-house operations, sales, tech, et cetera, yeah, we, we need to grow at a rate that allows the margin on the accounting work to cover these, these um, costs. Um, so yeah, it's a balancing act. We're constantly balancing that around the, the capital allocation. Yeah, okay. Um, How did you guys come up with the name, by the way? Name Pop. So that was, um, yeah, that was myself and Sydney when we merged Pitcher Partners and Moss Stevens. So 150 accountants coming together. And we had a, our first event was a Melbourne Cup day. And we mm -hmm. sort of did this big social event and we all had a really good time, lots of drinks, et cetera. And that was the first time me and Sydney started sort of connecting and chatting. And um, we started talking about the idea for, for Pop Tax around the opportunity. And there's not much competition online. It's a really good time to try and do something like this. This was back before my tax had really got some, some you know, some, some volume of users and updated the UI and all, UX and all that sort of thing. So we were pretty optimistic. And the Melbourne Cup was on. And we put a bet on and this horse won and it was this massive outsider. It, it shouldn't have won and it was called the Prince of Penzance. And it was funny, we were thinking about what we should call the company and I think Sid mentioned, hey, remember when we first caught up and we're talking about pop, uh, we're talking about starting this and that horse won the Melbourne Cup and we won money. We actually went, you know, we had a great night out, etc. And he said, why don't we call it Pot Prince of Penzance? And I was like, oh, that's great. So, yeah, that's kind of how it came about. So it was just this good story, story about, you know, connecting, talking about a, a big market opportunity. And, um, yeah, it's interesting. It started off a, a Melbourne Cup winning horse. I was, I was going to say, all like, like all many good business opportunities come from um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. occasions. So, um, no, that's, that's an awesome story. I really like it. Um, wanted to ask you, like, so you started a business, you had the pop tax, you know, you recovered from your hangover from the Melbourne Cup. Talk to me about your client acquisition in the early days, because that's always yeah. the hardest part. And as you said, like, you've got all this investor pressure, you know, you've got to deliver, you've left your comfy jobs. Cool. How do you go about marketing? How do you get your clients? Yeah, so this is probably the area that I've sort of learned the most in from starting the business. Initially, like it was friends, family, client referrals, a bit of online stuff. Um, we went really big in the digital marketing for pop tax. We tried everything. We tried, you know, your traditional Google, Facebook, YouTube. Um, we had like 16 actors for a day do all these little videos for occupation specific things in a studio with a guy directing it and rolled it out online. And we were on WeChat advertising through wechat we even had a couple of billboards we we're at when you 
What were your WeChat? Was it like to attract the Chinese market? Yeah, so we had um some Chinese staff, and they were like, "Hey, you should go on WeChat. Um, this is how it works. It's <laughs> you know you don't advertise, but the people have like influencer style like pages, and you can pay yeah. them, and they'll post." We had them build billboards, build. YouTube videos, Spotify. We got a we got an ad voiceover ad for for Spotify created. Yeah, we yeah. we tried so many channels. It was so interesting seeing how they all had. Did you get an agency? We did. We we like did. We had agency? we yeah. went through a few agencies and yeah, we just learned so much. Like a, a couple of key learnings are it's a long-term play. So if you want to really mm. do anything in the digital marketing space, whether it be Google Ads, Facebook, whether it be SEO and and ranking organically, um, content, YouTube, it's a really, it's, it needs to be a well thought out long term strategy. As an example, the way Google works is the algorithm gets better and better and it gets more learnings and it optimizes. And over time, it, it gets, you know, cheaper leads, hopefully. And hence, you're still, you're still in the hoping part. <laughs> yeah, well, well, it's working now, which is good. We're getting a good return. But Pop Tax, for an example, we, we launched Pop Tax, we threw a ton of money at it. And it didn't have any indicators, nothing. And we were just like throwing money out into the ether going, you know, send us clients. And, and um, <laughs> yeah, it, it took us some time to really understand how it works, what's the strategy, how you should value the return on your, your investment in marketing and, and looking at lifetime value and, and, and separating different mm-hmm. products and types of clients and these sort of things. Um, what was the one that worked for Partnerships. You so partnerships were the best. We've put a lot of time into working and collaborating with businesses that set up businesses online. And so and this is pop business. Pop now, business, pop yeah. Tax. And so we put a lot of time into that. We invested heavily in the relationship, the technology, so the lead automation, mm-hmm. um, tracking of the leads, um, reporting products, created some products together. So yeah. Can I can I interrupt for a second, Pat? Sorry. With the marketing campaign that you did initially, was that all pop tax, not pop business? Yeah. So what happened was it was pop tax for the first year. And then second year, yeah. it was pop tax for like nearly the whole tax season. And then towards the end, once the volume had died off, um, we started doing some advertising for the SMEs. So was the issue, like you said, you know, you kind of didn't meet your forecast and everything was off, et cetera. Um, and you didn't really go to plan initially. What, what, what do you attribute that to? I think a few things. I think, I think competition was one and the ATO was taking significant market share through my tax during that time. Mm-hmm. It does release statistics for how many lodge through their platform. And I think at the time they were like doubling which was just phenomenal how many users were lodging through my tax. And now they've kind of really took the market. But um, back then, that's when they were accelerating their, their market share. So I attribute like competition as being a real significant reasoning why. I think there's also like other attributes, like just not having the right fork, like the right modeling for the metrics for the customer acquisition. So maybe expectations. Mm-hmm. So the plan was to get a return on the ad spend and reinvest the return and keep, you know, growing our ad spend because we only had a really mm-hmm. short window and we only had a certain amount of funds to, to spend on advertising. When you, you had to spend money to get people to your platform. We only had this really short window of really sort of most of it would have been within the first two months, maybe four. And so I think it was it's, it's really difficult to create a digital marketing strategy where the whole business is going to come in a one one to two month sort of period. And so we just found, like I mentioned before, with with all our marketing on the business side, it's all all really long-term driven. It's content creation, it's branding, it's it's increasing awareness, it's ranking high, Mm -hmm. it's getting our advertising working for us. But it's all sort of longer-term strategy, whereas with Pop Tax, it was sort of, a shotgun approach where we'd just, you know, shoot everything. It's yeah. Fantastic. And so it was hard yeah. to. I can see the issue with the model straight away. Yeah. Because, like, obviously, one is razor thin margins. Like, you're, I think your lowest cost was sure. like 19 bucks for someone. Um, 
And you've got, as we said, like the very short time period you have to attract them in because that's when people start thinking about tax, which is literally like July, yep. basically. Um, and if you compare it to the business model, which is like, you know, it's, it's long sure. term. Businesses usually are pretty sticky to their, to their accounts and, and the value of that line is a lot bigger from a, like an annual perspective plus, a lot, you know, the lifetime value is a lot bigger as well. Um, and you can attract them at any time sure. of the year. So yeah, very, very different model. So I can see, I can see the issue. And I think one thing I learned recently with getting digital marketing agencies, I don't know what your experience is like, is like a lot of them charge as a percentage of your ad spend, um, which kind of creates a bit of a conflict of interest, I would imagine, where they probably encourage you to spend heaps on, you know, ads basically, because it gives them a percentage. Um, was that, can you talk a bit more about that? Like you said, cause you went, you said you went through quite a few of them. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting model that they have and it kind of maybe is akin to the financial services industry back in the day, but, um, yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, look, there's a lot of great marketing agencies out there and that do the right thing, but there's a lot that don't. And it's a really it's hard to find good quality. It's, it's in accounting. It's, you can go find a chartered accounting firm and you know that they've really put the time in to learn their craft and you can trust that it's probably mm -hmm. going to be at a pretty good standard. Um, whereas in that industry, it's, I feel like it's just a little wild, wild west in some respect. And everyone is a digital marketer and, you know, they all have great websites and some sort of case studies. Yeah. Yeah. And so, the, and there's a big gap between people who do it really well versus, you know, those who don't. Um, but yeah, we went through, a, went through a few trying to find, you know, someone that worked for us. And I, I think every business is different and as what they're trying to achieve is different as well. And so finding someone that is looking at your business holistically and working with you and thinking long-term and, um, looking at the return on your ad spend is really important. Um, but yeah, if, if you are looking for a digital marketing agency, it's good to get case studies. It's good to speak to um, some of their clients as if they're willing to do a testimonial, et cetera. So it's good to see if they've worked with accounting firms before because digital acquisition for accounting is not easy and it's very referral driven, the new business. So if you're trying to do a digital marketing strategy, it's it's not the easiest thing to implement. So you guys don't do that much of it now. It's mostly the focus is no very heavily on digital marketing mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, still. still so okay. it took us a while to work it out, and and we're getting you know good growth from organic leads through you know just ranking for the right keywords and doing. So when you talk about what works for you now from a digital marketing, what what is it exactly? Is it is it SEO part like the content generation or? Would you still, are you still putting up ads all the time as well? Yeah, we do both. So we do, um, the SEO is working quite good and that's obviously a long-term play. You've got to invest a lot of time and energy and, and understand that you're not going to get mm -hmm. benefits now. But if in the future, you that's kind of the holy grail. Like you want to be getting organic leads coming into your business. Yeah. You don't want to pay for all your, your leads because then you're constantly, it's, trying to get a return on your spend versus um, getting leads for free, basically. So it's a much better strategy, but it's also one where you need to invest resource, time and energy um, and cost now not getting a short-term return, um, which we've been really yeah. heavily focused on because we understand that, you know, in the future, if we need a lot of leads to support our growing sales team, there's only so much digital acquisition online and a lot do come through mm -hmm. organically. So if you can capture some of that, that's really important. So we've been investing in that. Google Ads we've been investing in. It's taken us, taken us some time to, to work that out. It's a long-term mm -hmm. play. If you try and do it in a short term, you probably spend a bit of money and just say it doesn't work. But if you put a bit of time into the account and work with the right people, it's, it's definitely something that can work. And we've done little things on LinkedIn and Facebook, et cetera, but we're more heavily focused on sort of, you know, SEO, content creation, partnerships, and definitely Google. Yeah, okay. Because um, as I said, like, it's, it's about building a funnel. It's not just cool, we put up an ad on Google and that's it. It's about like, okay, we've 
put up an ad on Google, we've captured some details, and then let's get the rest of the funnel working, which is content being sent out, some exactly. sort of interaction, and building up that trust and credibility, which might be, I don't know, what do they say in marketing? You need like seven or 19 touch points, whatever that magic number is that gets quoted around with a client before they trust you enough to work. Yeah, and so like part of your marketing strategy is definitely having a CRM and having, you know, some some value you can provide to yeah. potential leads and ways to engage them, ways to notify them if you've got, you know, special deals or sales, etc. So creating your database of potential leads is is super critical because you What are you guys using now, by the way, in terms of your CRM? Yeah, so we've we've our back end is our CRM. So we've sort of custom built our mm-hmm. back end and then we've just hooked in some sort of um, active campaign and that for sending out emails, et cetera. But I think in the future, we'll, like when we first started with PopTax, um, we had, oh, what was that CRM? It wasn't Salesforce. It was, anyway, it was, a, it was one similar to that. It was like two grand a month. So it was a bit, bit out of oh. our comfort level from an expense perspective to, to value. And so we kind of yeah. just paired it right back and, and now we've got our, our sort of custom built backend as SCRM and we've just got a few yeah. um, software that plugs into that to, to allow us to do certain things. So segment yeah. databases and things like that. Um, we talked about like, uh, you know, it, it's been a big journey over the last three years and you've grown to about 20 or so staff. Um, and obviously, I imagine growing very quickly at the moment as well. Um, what's your growth rate like right now? So we're kind of year, year to year, year. We we tripled this last financial year in, in revenue, revenue staff. and yeah. staff as well. And um, and we're probably looking we're probably looking at at least doubling for the next for this current financial year. Yeah. Okay. So to be able to do that, you need a lot of stuff, obviously. Um, it's something that most accounting firms struggle on a, you know, on a normal day, which with their 5% sure. growth, now doubling and tripling every year, it's a whole different ballgame. You talk about culture as something that you kind of have focused on and differentiate yourself from the traditional accounting model as well. Can you talk a little bit about that, like in terms of, you know, what is it that you do? How do you differentiate yourself? Um, and how do you go about attracting the right people? Yeah, sure. I suppose there's a few key differences to a traditional accounting firm and might be centered around our our age and our ambitions um, compared to, say, a traditional partner. I think that creates, you know, we're coming from a, a, we're coming from a sort of thought around, you know, how can we make this better for the employees and how can we make this the best possible place to work and how can we support them enough to, to, because, if we're growing at the rate we are as staff are absolutely critical. And if, and if we're not supporting them and if they're not happy coming into work, into work, and if they're not motivated, the whole thing won't work just by the type of business we're running. And so we invest a lot in our staff and um, really big on supporting them. We have, you know, we pay for gym memberships. So there's a gym just around the corner in Surrey Hills, um, invest, in, in, <clears throat> invest in the education really big on communication and support. So we do regular catch-ups and meetings. And I think the culture is is driven from the top down and we try and, you know, create a really positive and energetic working environment. And that translates to mm-hmm. how they service our clients. And so really focused on just supporting our staff along their journey and making sure that they they have the right tools and resources they need to succeed. And, and also... When we don't sort of have that I'm the boss, you're the employee relationship. So it's a bit different to a more corporate or traditional accounting firm. We're a bit more laid back. And I suppose there's just a expectation around performance as opposed to, you know, we, we don't, you know, grill any stuff or anything like that. It's mostly we have a vision, we have a plan, we've, we've got a lot of ambition to grow. And we want you to be, you know, growing with us. And as our business grows and gets big, there's going to be a ton of opportunities for you within the business. And obviously, there's going to be yeah. um, the, the business structure and the, the organizational team structure is going to change constantly 
because there's going to be new roles getting created as as the volume increases. So um, so for us, mm-hmm. it's it's really important to attract the right staff and the right team, people that have an ambition, people that want to grow with the business, people that are really customer centric. Um, and we we definitely it's not easy, and the current accounting market is challenging to find find staff to say the least yep. um, as I'm sure all the accountants out there are aware so for us to attract talent it's really about differentiating our business to a traditional firm and I think it's really easy to do that once we explain our business model how we're growing what we're trying to achieve what we can give to them to support their growth mm-hmm. and you know a lot of accountants are very focused on their progression on their career and so for us, it's, it's about supporting them and letting them know that, um, you know, we've got some really good long-term prospects and we want you to be a part of it. And here's how we're going to help you be a part of it and grow within our business. Okay. What, what, what is the vision that you sell to them? Yeah. So the vision is we, we basically want to be the Apple and the Amazon of the accounting world. What well, we want to be international. We want to be global. We want to be, um, you know, customer centric. And so... For us, for us, it's it's about having a business model that can scale and creating the the right systems and processes to provide a really great experience to clients and using technology to and creating and building technology to facilitate that. And then our people are our most important thing. So we're an accounting firm; it's relationship driven. So your accountants, you know, are, are fundamental to 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 how your business is going to perform. And so for us, it's about, I suppose the vision for the team is, do you want to come along on the journey in a growing company that is going to change the way accounting services are delivered? Do you want to be a part of innovating within the accounting space? You know, what what do you want in your career? And does that align to what we're trying to achieve? Okay. How do you deal with KPIs and timesheets? Yeah. So we definitely do timesheets. KPIs, we we do it on an individual and a team basis. And Why do you do timesheets, by the way? Because uh, it's, it's, it's a controversial thing in accounting. Yeah, so days. we didn't initially, and we just found it really hard to to get the right data to make decisions. Because <laughs> it's exactly, I, had, I, don't, I don't know if you listened to the most recent podcast I did with Shay Taya. Um we talked about timesheets and like, you know, she's all about technology and automation. It's like she worked in the internal finance area of video, for example, um, uh, and another large material. And as much as like, it seems so antiquated, like timesheets, you know, like she said, it's bad for mental health. It's not really good for you. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, but man, the data, yeah. like you need the data to measure your, your, your matrix basically your that's account. right it's really difficult to operate without them we didn't have them initially and i was i was of the opinion maybe we could find a solution that was separate to that mm. but we just couldn't get the right data it was really hard to to work out the productivity of uh, the profitability sorry on the productivity the profitability of the different products so for us because we're a new business we were trialing it's like any new accounting any new any new business in any industry right you never get your pricing right straight away you there's always a Mm, yeah and there's always a process you go through to find pricing where you where you want to fit within the market and that makes sense and you can you know you can run your business profitably um but you to work that out you kind of need some data against it to understand what the what the pricing points should be and so for us that was the catalyst to put putting the timesheets back in just so we could get an understanding of what what's actually happening and then separate to that it's yeah. like rewarding staff as well so creating a culture of performance based and wanting people to be accountable to their results and wanting to reward people for for their results so i don't see it as a um, for some it's probably annoying they've got to do it but the the reasoning mm. for doing it is to genuinely um have an understanding of how the business is running so we can make decisions that will benefit everybody yeah. and then also reward people for, for performing um, and, and meeting meeting their targets. So if they don't do anything, if they don't do any timesheets, sorry, and they're just rocking up and just doing a bit of work, it's hard to put metrics and it's hard to put KPIs and it's hard to reward people 
um, when you're not really looking at any data, it's like, yeah, they're showing up, they're doing a good job, but, but how do I measure that? Um, do you do anything unique like that you haven't seen in, in other accounting firms, like in the way you reward them or in the way, you know, remunerate them or anything like that? We're doing, we, so we just did, I don't, I, I suppose accounting firms do do this. We just did a strategy planning day and we, we did a bit of a Hoshan matrix and went through our five-year goals, annual objectives, all our activities to achieve those objectives and then the, the key KPIs to, to reach to, mm -hmm. to, to see if we're achieving those, those annual activities. And from that, individual KPIs come out. And so it's all tying back to the annual objectives and then the annual objectives need to be tying into the sort of stretch three to five year goals and objectives. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, we've, we've just created a system to, to, to track and measure that on a regular basis, um, have some quarterly team team benefits, so reward team performance, mm -hmm. and then individually at the end of the year, um, we're just sort of in the process of trying to formulate the best system um, for rewards because not everyone is purely mm -hmm. driven by a, a bonus of money or something. Um, so we're trying to just understand very focused on team objectives because we want people to help each other and we want, you know, if everyone's operating together, we're going to get a greater outcome. So I think having team okay. incentives and team goals is, is really important. And then individual goals, um, we're sort of looking at that more so just to make sure it fits within the overall strategy. And then from a reward perspective, it's um, we're sort of looking at, sort of bonuses and some, some other things at the moment. Um, but we also have other incentives like we use Employment Hero. It's a great platform for our payroll. And if staff gets reviews, they have Employment Hero credits. So we, we credit people for or not just Google reviews, but it could be anything where they do an activity that aligns to our values. Um, so we are big on incentivizing and, and trying to sort of, mm -hmm. you know, reward people for doing the right thing. Okay. How do you go about attracting staff, uh, especially at the beginning being a kind of a no name? Yeah, the start was hard. Um, it was real, it was, it was kind of difficult to, took a lot of, um, I suppose it took a lot of work in the, the interviews to sell the business to the right people. Um, we, mm -hmm. we just went through a mix of, we've, we've tried multiple platforms to attract staff and um it seems to seems to me that accountants go through recruiters so if you want to account it <laughs> you're going to start reaching out to to recruiters to to try and attract the staff if you're um, just starting out and you don't really have a reputable business that people are like hey i want to go work for them um yeah. so for us it was just we we tried the seek ads we tried the linkedin um, we did hire hire through Seek. Um, didn't have any luck on our LinkedIn, and most of our hires came through recruiters. But we've got a we're sort of looking at a strategy in house as well to to you know if we're going to be hiring so much staff over the near future, we probably need something a little better than um, you know just to be always you know reaching out to multiple people, etc. Okay. And what sort of skills do you look for? Yeah, it's a good, it depends on the position we're hiring for. Um, if it's an accountant, given the type of business we are, we strongly look for people who are good communicators and, um, mm -hmm. and I think who will fit the culture as well is really important because, you know, the initial 20 here are creating and building the culture. So there's a lot we pass on through and how we act is obviously translated throughout the company, but it's the initial employees as well that are creating that, that culture. And um, so we've been really um, careful around who we get in the business. Um, but, mm. but skills, it's, we do look at depending on the position and the senior already of the position, um, so we do look at the technical skill set and all that, but I think probably the attitude, the, their own ambitions, um, what we think they can bring to the business, um, 
so there's a few other sort of but the communication piece i think is um is really important for us so getting people that can communicate to clients and we can utilize the offshore work to to create some efficiencies so it's really about finding staff who who are good communicators who are really attentive who really care about seem like they're going to care about the the clients well what are, what are some mistakes you made in the hiring process because i find it's always a trial and error thing as well um we don't have much turnover if any so i probably don't have any mistakes <laughs> i can't i can't um say anything there i mean the stuff stuff we've got well, oh in the hiring process that's probably yeah not yeah i mean like have you refined like have you like what, what does it look like do you have a particular process that you follow yeah you sure so we like, you know, of course it, like, yeah we've got an them? operations team member who's um she's great she's joined us not too long ago and she was at deloitte and she's um i worked at a couple of places so she's kind of assisting with the initial screening um and so she's mm-hmm. got a set list of things that we're kind of looking for and she's you know tying back our values to the 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 um the hiring so she's basically what happens is when we have a role available we'll advertise for it we'll reach out to yeah. our network to see if anyone knows anyone and then based on who comes back she does the initial interviews and the screening and then we do a second interview if 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 they get to that stage and it'll most likely be myself who does the interview and then um if i'm comfortable with making the decision based on doing a few interviews etc then you know i'll do that if i'm not if i need a second opinion i'll grab our manager to to jump in and do an interview as well if it's close between candidates yeah okay um but oh, I just out of curiosity, what was your experience like? What has it been like today with agencies when you were hiring? I think it's been it's been okay. I think the I think yeah, it's it's been it's been fine. It's 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 a mixed, a mixed bag. bag. Yeah, I some such a, yeah from clients. I always hear a lot of horror stories. I think for the most part, what they say we've kind of got put in front of us, if that makes sense. So. Um, if they've said someone is what they are for the most part, that's been what they are. So that's been quite good. And yeah, I haven't had too many bad experiences. It's just, um, it's not cheap going through a recruiter if you're growing, <laughs> like if you're going to hire, yeah. you know, seven accountants in a year or something, then all of a sudden it's like, or 10 or more. And all of a sudden it's a really mm-hmm. big cost. So for us, it's just about, um, that element of it versus the process side of it, um, if that makes sense. Yeah. So just making sure that we're making the right commercial decision with that process. But yeah, we've found that this a, a lot of the good candidates go just straight to recruiters. Um, and so if you do yeah. want to um, get good talent, that's you know you've you've kind of got to go down that avenue to sort of get in front of as many people as you you need to. How did you guys conclude that, that you know, good candidates go to recruiters? I think it was mostly just maybe our lack of success by, by advertising for roles. And maybe it's on mm-hmm. us and we haven't done enough work. or but, but it was mostly us putting job ads up and seeing what came back. And just historically, <laughs> it hasn't been what we were looking for. Um, and, yeah. and when we reach out, we... we the, it's just that like the, there's just a lot more volume that can get put in front of you for you to make a decision around who might be suitable. Um, mm-hmm. So even just to get the interviews lined up and to get in front of candidates, um, we've, that's what we've found that we've needed to go down that stream. And I think we haven't like yeah. built the business big enough and the brand isn't strong enough yet to the talent to be like, oh, I love what those guys are doing over there. That's amazing. We, we see them online. We see them everywhere. Mm-hmm. They're doing, they seem to be blowing up. That's great. I want to see what they're doing. We're not, we're not really getting any of that yet. So for us, it's, um, we've put a few, we always do an ad, but it, we just don't seem to get the, the candidates through that we're looking for. And so we, we reach out to 
some recruiters to to get um, some CVs through. And I know that's that's what you do, right? Ex- excellent. I, I, look, I, I'm, 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 I'm only asking just because it's um, it's interesting to see how clients a their experience because you hear a lot of horror stories. Um, because obviously, same as any industry, you know, you've got your, your good players and your bad players. Um, but I, I guess I wanted to hear your views on it as a firm that's obviously budget sure. conscious, um, has investors, but is still willing to invest in paying fees, which, you know, as you said, it kind of, the way you put it, it does come across as a necessary yep. evil in a way. Um, and it kind of is like, well, it's definitely not a cheap exercise. Um, but what I wanted to hear is like, cool, why do you guys do it given that there is, you know, budget constraints and, and pressure, et cetera. Um, when I still have firms telling me, no, 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 we're not interested in paying your fees. You guys are too expensive. We don't even know why anyone would use you or pay you a fee. I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. So here, here is a perspective that is reality. And I just wanted to hear from you because majority of accounting firms do yes. use agencies because they've had an identical experience yep. to you. They've tried seek, they tried this, they tried that. It's like they just have you know hundred CVs of crap, you know. Um, surely, they're, they're like you do get stuff, you just get crap. That's you know, um, and to get anyone that's worth hiring in a with a quick turnaround is a challenge. Definitely, that's got the skill set. Um, and, and I think yeah, like a lot of the accounting firms look at it, it's like, well, why can't they just put an ad and seek, etc. Like you can, but a do you want to sift through 100 CVs to get maybe something that's okay, not even great, um, or do you want to go to someone that's actually doing this day in day out? Like that is all they do is talk to accountants, and you know when you need someone. That's right. Them. And there is a long term. Like I mean, if you're hiring staff with the intent of keeping them on, nurturing them, developing them, and watching them grow within the business, it's 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 an investment to make. Um, and it's just yeah. about making sure that that investment is in line with your, your, your budgeting, et cetera. And it's an investment that you can, um, afford to make. Um, but, but mm-hmm. if it depends on your growth, like if you're just hiring an accountant or two here or there a year, you know, if you're just hiring one or two, then, you know, I wouldn't balk at paying a recruiter fee because it's an investment in the person. And if you business is running as it should, then you'll get a great return on it, especially if they're a great candidate. Um, it's just... Yeah, that's, that's the other thing. Like, the reason we do this, we, we chose our niche, which is accounting firms, is it's kind of a no-brainer. Like, if you're paying my fee, yes, it's high, but you've got to, you know, all of the staff that I give you, they're all revenue earners. They should be generating two to three multiple of their income, of the, of the salary, yeah. essentially. Um, so it's, it's like... I'm not giving you an overhead. I'm not adding to it. Like I'm giving you a revenue earn that's going to make you two to three hundred grand a year. What are you worried about? Like a ten or twelve or fifteen sure. grand fee. Um, but yeah, some it's interesting how some accountants still struggle with that concept. Um, look, we're going to start wrapping up because I know you've got to go. Um, I'll ask you a few questions. What What are some things that you believe in that many others disagree on or think that you're crazy? What was that? Sorry, what do I? What what are some of the things that you believe in that many others might disagree on or think that you're crazy? Um, I don't know. There's don't want to say anything too controversial here. <laughs> Go uh, for it. No. I'm not going to stop you. Um, oh, look, probably, probably, I'm not sure. There's there's probably not too much. I I, I think. I, I don't know, maybe, maybe manifestation. I really believe maybe people agree with that as well. But, you know, whenever I've asked the universe something, I've, I've kind of, it's came back in a, in a very accommodating way. And so I feel like there, there has to be something between setting your intentions and asking for something and then it coming to fruition. And I don't know what it is, but there's some energy or something within, there's something more than, than, what we can all see um given how do you go about doing it do you do like affirmations or do you write like do you write it down yeah i for sure visualize visualize affirmations um i've done it heaps in my life whether it was needing to raise money or whatever it was it was 
whenever I needed something, I, I just, you know, I'd, I'd say it over and over again. I'd, I'd visualize it. I'd meditate. I'd write it down. I'd mm-hmm. really put it out into the universe. And very rarely when I've really wanted something, has it, has it not come to fruition. So it makes me think that maybe there is something more to it than just, um, you know, I don't know, than, than just a thought, right? Yeah. I, I think also, uh, uh, and Luca probably shares a similar belief too, um, the only issue I have with the whole law of attraction thing and what I've always had with it is like, there's a lot of work that goes into mm, the fruition aspect. Like it's not just sitting there on your couch and going, cool, I just want money to come to me. Like you probably sure. put in a lot of effort to go out and contact people and, you know, network, etc. Like there's activity that goes behind the manifestation that kind of needs to Completely be. Completely agree. Well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, cool. What's something that most people don't know about you? Um, I don't know. It depends how well you know me. Probably. <laughs> um, probably that I that I love listening to podcasts. So I, I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, I'm a huge fan of, 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 you know, I, in my spare time, I'm always, you know, I've got a bit of a thirst for knowledge and it doesn't matter what it is, but I'm, I'm always loving just chucking the headphones in and listening to, to interesting people talk about things. And so, um, so besides accountants, besides so accountants, I suppose, um, I like that Tim Ferriss has got, had some good guests. Um, I know this is very mainstream now, but, but Joe Rogan over his years has had a lot of interesting guests. Um, I've listened to a, yeah, just the whole, whole range of different people, whatever's come up on my thing. I've listened to thousands mm-hmm. and thousands of podcasts and found them to be really useful. And I've always got something, something from them. When do you find the time to do it? <laughs> Given everything. Yeah. It's, life. it's, it's when I was um, driving into work. Um, yeah. So when I'm driving, um, sometimes on the weekend, if I'm going for a walk or a run, um, in the gym. So just before lockdown, I was, I was mm. in the gym a lot. And so it was just, um, you know, some people have got, um, techno music blaring. I'd have podcasts going while I'm working out. Yes. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty much a replica of what I do, sure. driving, walking yeah. and, and the gym and listening it's, to Tim Ferriss. Funny thing, I don't know what your experience has been like, but like, um, I guess I've been listening to Tim Ferriss and a few other podcasts, but like after a few years of listening, I've kind of like, it's, it's been probably at least six or eight months to listen to a Tim Ferriss podcast. Um, because it becomes a like, bit repetitive. Kind of yeah. 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 I, for sure. I have breaks. Or... Like I do have breaks. Like sometimes I'll go for a period without listening to anything for a while and I'll get back into yeah. this music and just sort of, you know, I just can't, put the energy into it but then it comes some yeah. just it's like a calling and then sometimes i'm just you know i get that um i don't know i just get that want to get it back happening again and i'm back into it and mm-hmm. loving it and listening to things and then yeah so yeah because i kind of switch between audiobooks and like a sure. podcast, and then i just do a couple of audiobooks at a, at a stretch and then it's like oh yeah okay i should you know it's been a while since i've heard you get a bit bored voice, so yeah i should get back yeah. into it yeah. um all right that's awesome what let's do some rapid fire questions and we'll finish up what is what's your favorite quote my favorite quote is probably what the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve yeah okay is it like from the science yeah think and grow rich so i love the there's a lot of good stuff i took out of that book um what have you read watched or learned recently that's had the most impact on you it's an interesting one I think yeah probably yeah I'm not too sure to be honest it's a good good question I think the last last few months have been 
in lock last month sorry six weeks has been in in lockdown and 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 just just working so much so i'm not too sure i'll come back was there a book that you read that's like you know you love gifting or you recommend yeah i think i love how to win friends and influence people i love the it's just an old it's an older book classic classic, a lot of good messages um read ray dalio principles that was good um a couple of marketing books that were really useful um yeah what was the most useful one the marketing one? um there was a book by seth godden um oh yeah Pretty much all yeah of yeah cool. yeah it was it was really good the purple cow whatever i think it yeah i think i think it was tribes that was the last one i read it was really tribes. interesting yeah okay no i love Seth Godin. brilliant guy um what have you bought recently that's had a tremendous impact on you i bought i Rain. bought a recently i bought a nine six surfboard a massive gun it's it's this yeah it's a huge, huge board yeah. and i i've been um yeah I, I surf a bit and it's been interesting to get a board of that size normally i'm on really short surfboards and what, what made you well my friend that? messaged me and just said um you know, I went. I was in Mexico for a for two months at Puerto Escondido, surfing bigger waves, and we're always on these shorter boards. And I snapped about ten boards in the two months I was there. And right at the end, we we finally got on a, a step up, a big enough board that was you know better for the types of waves. And um, and I was always interested in getting out in some bigger surf. So I got this board to to see if I can get amongst any of the the winter swells that are coming through. Um, mm-hmm. and it's been good to, to just take for a paddle too, whilst it's flat. So on the, on, um, on the weekend, Sunday, two days ago, I just took it out for flat for a paddle, um, which was nice. So it's, it's good to do a bit of training on it as opposed as, as well as, as just surfing. Okay. Where do you normally surf? Well, so I live, I live in Bondi, but I go to probably Maroubra the most to surf. Yeah. I went to yeah, Maroubra okay. on s- Saturday. So yeah, that's no. I was, I was like, Marubra is awesome for surfing, but yeah, Bondi is a more fun yeah, it's a good to, good spot to live. Sydney in general is is a bit tricky with with the surf. Grew up in Port Macquarie, and it's it's these open beaches, lots of waves, and then you you come here and there's lots of crowds, mm-hmm. so it's it's completely different. But <laughs> it's still great to get in the water. And last question: Who would you want to have a drink with the most in the world, past or present? I think present. I think I think past probably Marcus Aurelius. I think he'd be really yeah. interesting. Um, I, I I listen to and read up a lot on um, a lot of his sort of philosophy and thoughts. Um, Tim Ferriss influence. I can't remember if it was Tim. It probably was the Stoic sort of. It might have been him, but yeah. Um, so yeah, it'd be just crazy to catch up with him just based on the time he was living in and how how much power he had yet how insightful what would you ask him i'd like to just understand how the world was back then and and it'd be really interesting to gather his thoughts around how his mindset is the way it was when the when you know he had so much power and influence um yet he Mm. was um yet he he had the thoughts he had it's quite incredible that someone with that much um, influence and power was, you know, the, this wasn't just having, yeah, yeah. The, I mean, the thoughts and stuff yeah. he has is, is really insightful and really interesting and really deep. And, um, he seemed like a very caring and good person. So it would have been interesting to just see how he came to, to get to that point and, um, how the times were back then. And, and I suppose there'd be, you know, so much learnings you could get from just a simple conversation with a guy like that. Um, and then present, probably, I think maybe Richard Branson, just based on how much. Yeah. Um, I always looked up to him, up to him, and was always really interested in what he was doing and reading reading up on him, etc. Whilst I was, you know, studying, and I just think he's um, mm. he's a brand machine. He's he's 
built some amazing businesses and different industries and he's done a really sort of fantastic job at um on his endeavors and he's had a lot of challenges and um he's he's just yeah. uber successful so it'd be great to to catch up and just share some some insights yeah I'm st- i keep checking my mailbox i'm still waiting for my <laughs> well. you might be waiting a while <laughs> yeah yeah i was like you know he's, he's getting yeah, older he so but just went into space awesome. patrick it's been awesome thank you so much for making the time and yeah i look forward to catching up with you when we're out sounds of good we'll, we'll go for a beer <laughs> Thank you for tuning in and hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like our podcast and share it on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, wherever it is you hang out so more people can benefit from these speakers. Also, please subscribe on our website so you get all of our latest episodes. And if there's anything else I can help you with or you have speakers you'd love to hear from or some feedback about the current episode, please feel free to send an email to michael at recruitmentexpert.com.au. Until then, take care and I look forward to connecting with you in the future.